following Jesus, no turning back, regardless of what the world says. For the past several weeks, other than last Sunday, Lance has been teaching uh, his lessons out of 2 Peter, and he's been talking about the internal influences of individuals who profess to be Christians but are doing their best to teach heresy, false prophets, etc., to lure Christians out of Christianity. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, it says, But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the Master, the one who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. I'd like you to, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. It's on page 472 in the Brown Pew Bible, 472. And we're going to be looking at some of the external influences that people allow to draw them away from Christianity and being a child of God. So Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What advantage does a man have in all his work which he does under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. Also, the sun rises and the sun sets. It hastens to its place, but rises again. Blowing towards the south, then turning towards the north, the wind continues swirling along. And on its circular course, the wind returns. All the rivers flow to the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place where the rivers flow, they flow again. All things are wearisome. Man is not able to tell it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. That which has been is which that will be. And that which has been done is that which will be done. So there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one might say, see this, it is new. Already it has existed for ages which were before us. Now granted, notwithstanding all of the technological advances that we have seen throughout the centuries, what the writer of Ecclesiastes is talking about is the basic human condition. What's been done, has been done, and it will be done. And those of us that have lived any length of time, we can see that while the trappings have changed, it's still the same thing. Wars, destruction, and we need to understand that no matter how civilized we think we've become in the 21st century, as long as mankind inhabits the earth, there will be pain, there will be suffering, there will be oppression, and there will be strife. And all of the ugly things that human beings can do to each other, they will do. And that they have already been done throughout the ages. But all of the wonderful, beautiful things that God gave us in his creation, that is there for us as well. As the writer of Ecclesiastes wrote nearly 3,000 years ago, there is nothing new under the sun. Now Jesus was asked this question about the end times by his disciples. Give us a sign. When will we know? What can we look for? How can we be sure when we need to be ready? Well, Jesus' response was, you need to be ready all the time. But he says in Matthew chapter 24, beginning in verse 6, you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, for nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places there will be famines and earthquakes. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time many will fall away, and many will betray one another and hate Many false prophets will arise and many will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one that endures to the end will be saved. So Jesus is saying that we're going to see all of these wicked, bad, evil things happen, but you remain steadfast to the end and you will be saved. Do not desert the faith. Now, I'm not that old. Although some days I feel older than others, and when the aches and pains come, I feel even older than those days. But 
But I never believed that we would live in a country where it would become fashionable to ridicule or persecute Christians. Where God and Jesus are banished from even being mentioned in a public meeting or in schools. Where Christian bakers or photographers are persecuted by the government for deciding to obey God rather than doing what's culturally popular. School teachers who are being persecuted or threatened with their jobs for simply displaying a Bible on their desk or saying, God bless you, to a little school child. But as we just read, Jesus warned us not that these would happen, but that they will happen. I'd like to read an article that I, I ran across as I was uh, doing the research for this. It is dated 11-15, uh, so it's just a few days ago. And the title of the article is, City Threatens Grandfather for Reading Bible Without a Permit. There it is. I'm serious. Paul Johnson, a grandfather, just wanted to share his religious faith with people in his town, Sweetwater, Tennessee. So he went down, downtown for the Solar Eclipse Festival in August and stood on the side of the road to greet people. His lawyers explained he did not enter the parking lot adjacent to him or the portion of the festival where booths were set up but stayed on a public way. He did not in any way obstruct traffic or cause any other problems. Such actions, however, have been determined by city officials, this is the government, to be a demonstration and therefore illegal without a permit. And no one's handing out permits. Police told Johnson that reading a Bible out loud on a public sidewalk fell within the definition of a demonstration pursuant to an outdated city ordinance. As such, Mr. Johnson, Johnson needed a permit from the city to read his Bible on a public sidewalk. But when Mr. Johnson applied for a permit, a city official arbitrarily denied his request. Johnson said he was shocked that a city had a law banning anyone from reading the Bible on a public sidewalk without the city's permission. All I want to do is tell the people about the love of Jesus by reading my Bible, but I was worried I might be arrested and tried. Johnson also set clarity, set, uh, sought clarity from the city as to whether he could speak anywhere else in Sweetwater, but the chief, Berm, chief of police, responded that he could not do so anywhere within the city limits because he did not have a permit. He then tried to get a permit, but has yet to receive a response from the city. Jesus warned us, they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by people because of my name. This wasn't California or New York or Massachusetts where you might expect something like this. This was in the Bible Belt, Sweetwater, Tennessee. All he wanted to do was read the Bible in public. And I'll guarantee you that if they had read the Quran, not a word would have been said. But the persecution of Christians because we tend to be sheep. You know, through the natural attrition, we lose and gain uh, members in the congregation. Some people pass away, they move to other cities, they move here. But we need to ask ourselves, where are, all, where are the others who haven't passed away or moved to other cities? Where are they? And I'm sure that many of us, Brian and I were talking about this this morning, many of us can look around here and wonder, where's such and such? How come we haven't seen them in a while? Where's such and such? Have they decided that following Jesus just isn't worth the effort? Have they decided that the pull or the lure of the world and its pursuits and pleasures are more important than following Jesus? Are they too involved with their friends, their jobs, and other activities that they believe outweigh the benefits of being a Christian? Remember, Jesus said, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Can think about this. If you had friends, co workers, or schoolmates who criticize Christians because we don't engage in worldly pursuits or we don't engage in questionable activities at work or recreation, would it be easier not to admit that you're a Christian than to defend Christ and risk being 
shunned or ridiculed or made fun of? Or do we just adopt the attitude, I'll be quiet and get along with everybody. I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want, I want everybody to be my friend. The Apostle Paul, writing through inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to he that believeth, to the Jew first, and also the Greek. Romans 1.16. We're going to be ridiculed, you can rest assured of that. But we still have the duty to proclaim the gospel and live according to the tenets that God has given us. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 8. It's on page 195 in your pew Bible. This is one of those stories throughout the Old Testament that I really like this story because it shows how even the mighty will fall. <coughs> And how no matter what the status of an individual in life is, life is, he is still to obey God and not on his terms. Beginning in verse 4, 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4, it says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all nations. Now the nations that the children of Israel were talking about. We want to be like them. We want a king like them. These were Canaanite pagan nations. They engaged, engaged in idolatry, child sacrifice. God describes them as wicked. And one of the tasks that Joshua had was to destroy all these people because they are wicked people. But the children of Israel, we want a king so we can be like them. Verse 6. But the thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they say to you. For they not, have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being their king. So, some people re so the people rejected God as their king, just as we see that some Christians have abandoned Christ because they want to be like their worldly friends, or for whatever reason, they no longer choose to follow Christ. Go back a little bit further with me to 1 Samuel chapter 15, page 201 in your pew Bible. And this is the story where God sent his prophet Samuel to anoint Saul to be the first earthly king. In verse 1 we read, Samuel said to Saul, I am, the Lord, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you, king over his people, Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. <clears throat> and if you're interested in reading about this particular battle, it's found in Exodus 17. And it's actually a pretty interesting story. So let's go back to pick up the reading in verse 3. Now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put them to death, men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkey. I'm going to read verse 3 again. Now go, attack the Amalekites, and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put them to death, men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Pick up the read. That's pretty clear. We're going to pick up the reading in verse 7. Then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havla to Sir, near the eastern border of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he did totally destroyed with the sword. But Saul and the army spared Agag, and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lambs, everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak they totally destroyed. What was God's command to Saul in verse 3? To destroy everything. Verse 10, And the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and not carried out my instructions. And Samuel was distressed and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, 
he set up a monument for himself and turned and proceeded to go down to Gilgal. So at this point in the story, we see that Saul's pretty well uh, become arrogant. He's puffed up. He's proud. Look at the accomplishments that I've done. Of course, destroying the Amalekites partway, he gives God no credit for this at all. So it builds a monument to himself. And we can remember numerous stories throughout the Old Testament where God interceded on the behalf of one of his people, and they built a monument to God. Verse 13, Samuel said to Saul, and Saul said to him, I'm sorry, Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of oxen that I hear? Saul said, They. Now notice that Saul at this point, King Saul, begins to blame the people. Not me, them. He attempts to shift the blame to others. Saul is the king. The command was given to Saul. He says, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people. Not me, the people. Spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we have utterly destroyed. And Samuel said to Saul, wait. Let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he, Saul, said to him, speak. Samuel said, Is it not true, though, that while you were little in your own eyes, you were made head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed you king over Israel? And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul, Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. This is one of those half-truths. And went on a mission on which the Lord sent me. And I had brought back Agag, the king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, here again, the people, took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination. Divination is the uh, practice of fortune telling and tarot cards and witchcraft and so on. And insubordination is as inequity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed trespassed the command of the Lord in your words because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now here's the money verse, or here's the takeaway from all this. In verse 24, and Saul tries to justify his sin of disobedience. I feared the people and listened to their voice. In other words, and this is by the way where things start to really look bad for Saul. In other words, it's more important for Saul to do what the men or the people wanted, or our friends, co-workers, neighbors, and what God has instructed us to do. It reminds me of Adam and the sin that of disobedience that he engaged in when he decided to do what he wanted him to do and not what God instructed him to do. But he lays the blame at Eve's feet. Eve sins and she blames the serpent or Satan. Jesus said, Fear not them which kill the body, but which are able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to do it, destroy both the soul and the body. Matthew 10, 28. We have become so concerned about wanting to please those around us, to be like those around us,
because they can advance our careers or invite us to the next party or gathering so we can become popular, that we tend to lose perspective of what is truly, eternally important. And Jesus said that is to seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What does Jesus say the greatest commandment is? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. Matthew 22, 37, 38. And James over in his epistle drives this point home when he says, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now that word enmity is a pretty strong word. It means the state of or feeling of being actively opposed or hostile to someone or something. Let me paraphrase James 4.4. Do you know that friendship with the world means that you are in a state or feeling of being actively opposed to or at war or hostile to God? So if we want to be friends with the world, we're at war with God. And I can tell you right now, it's going to win that battle. So it's not in our best interest to be friends of the world. Years ago, when I was a boy, about 11 years old, I attended a congregation uh, with my aunt, uncle, and my grandmother. I lived with them briefly after my mother died in uh, Vallejo, California. And the minister there at the time, a, uh, an Oklahoma gentleman by the name of Clyde Wilson. And Clyde was about as tall as Abraham Lincoln. And he had a James Earl Jones voice, that just professional preacher voice. And like most 11-year-olds during the sermon, I was just wandering anywhere but here. My mind was a little egg or whatever in the world it was. But Clyde said something that has resonated with me to this day. He said, I would rather be alone in heaven than have the world's population with me in hell. Think about that. All of your friends out there, all of our co-workers, and everybody that we associate with, I hope they go to heaven. That's their decision. But I would rather be alone in heaven with God and Jesus and the angels and the apostles than to have everybody in the population with me in hell. You know, the strongest and most faithful apostles and disciples that we see were not immune from having their Christian brothers desert them. Second uh, Timothy, uh, page four, pastor Court, eight four two, in your pew Bible, eight forty two. The Apostle Paul is writing to his uh, son in the faith, as he called him, <coughs> the young evangelist Timothy, and he is describing in verse fifteen. He says, "You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Pagilius and Demogenes." Paul also talks about his friends in the faith. Over in Colossians 4.15, he says, Our dear friend, hold that, hold 2 Timothy though. Our dear friend Luke, the, doc, the doctor, and Demas, sing greetings. I want you to remember the name Demas. Over in Philemon, verse 23, Paul says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greet you, as do Mark, Erasticus, Demas, Luke, and my fellow workers. But back in 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse 10, Paul sends some that sad news to Timothy. And he says, Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Demas was once a devoted, trusted fellow worker and companion of Paul. But then Paul lists him as one who has deserted him for worldly pursuits. In 2 Timothy 4.14, Paul says, Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. Now Demas and Alexander, Vigilius and Hermogenes must have been well known to the brethren throughout Asia because Paul lists them specifically in these letters. Perhaps the most famous story from the New Testament about a disciple of Christ that denies him is the story of Peter. 
found in chapter 18 of John during the Inquisition or the, the trial of Jesus, Peter's watching the proceedings from a distance. He doesn't want to get too close, just kind of close enough to keep an eye on the proceedings, but he doesn't want to get too close to Jesus because he can see which way this thing's going. But when he's recognized as one of Jesus' followers, he denies him three separate occasions. Verse 17, 25, and 26. Now Peter was afraid that if he was recognized as one of Jesus' disciples, that the same treatment that Jesus was undergoing was going to be inflicted upon him. Why was that? Because Peter feared the people and the Jewish elite, the Jewish rulers. But that haunting, furtive glance of Jesus to Peter when the cock crowed, just that glance, Peter realized what he had done, and he went out and wept bitterly. Now, I was trying to come up with a way to really get a good analogy of that, that glance, but everybody, every male in here who's married has had that glance, I'll tell you that right now. And you're going to hear about it when you get home, too, so just knock off what you're doing. But you know, later Peter gives a graphic description of what a Christian faces when they return to the world. And he's perhaps remembering his own denial. And he describes them as being a dog returning to their vomit, or a sow returning to wallowing in the mud, 2 Peter 2, 21-22. And it's not a pretty picture. It's a very graphic picture of someone who was once clean and is now completely filthy again. But what about those who have, those of us who have stumbled along the path blazed by Christ and the Apostles? We've seen the error of our ways, and we have made it and returned to the faith. Jesus tells the story of the prodigal son, and how his father rejoiced at his return and threw a great banquet to show how happy he was at their return. Luke chapter 15, 11, 32. So what's our role here? What is our responsibility? Well, we need to encourage those who have departed the faith to return to Christ before it's eternally too late. You don't get a do-over. And we need to be steadfast in our service to Christ so that we can say, as the Apostle Paul said, I have fought the good fight, I have run the race, and I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have longed for his appearing, 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 8. You know, there's an old saying that I'm sure everybody in here has heard, actions speak louder than words. And we look at the story of King Saul, all the good intentions, yes, Lord, I will destroy the Amalekites, utterly destroy every single one of them, every single one of their possessions. But his actions spoke louder than his words. And we look at the individuals that Paul had listed, Demas and the other individuals, who started out following Christ, but abandoned Christ. Their actions spoke long, louder than their words. And Peter, who denied Christ. But Peter came back and realized what he had done, and he went on to be one of the great apostles. You know, our life is pretty much that way. We can tell people that we're Christians and so on and so forth, but what are our actions? Because our actions can betray our words. Jesus said, therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, and we can deny Jesus by our actions, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. It's not easy standing our ground in the world today. It's never been easy for the people of God to stand their ground against Satan and the world. That's why we have God's help. That's why God gave us the church. It's a place of refuge. That's why we have each other for support and encouragement. As a place where we can go to escape the world. But our job is to convert the world. That's our task. 
you know, we have such small minds, and we may be geniuses in whatever our field of endeavor is, but we cannot fully comprehend eternity. Kim, Kim Walker and I were talking about this the other day, I think it was two Sundays ago, and we were trying to draw analogies of, of eternity. You can't. But remember, as long as eternity is, that's how long hell's going to be. It never ends. And I told Kim, I said, you know what, it, it kind of reminds me of, if I could come up with an analogy, it would be to take a single grain of sand, pick it up, and walk around the world and deposit it. Walk back, get another grain of sand, until you have picked up every single grain of sand off every beach, every riverbed, every uh, sand dune, every desert. And you got it in this big pile, now you do it again. It'll never end. That's eternity. Now, we have the choice, and the choice is ours, whether we spend eternity with God and Jesus, or we spend the eternity in hell. That's our decision. And I would hope that if you are in here this morning, and you've listened to this lesson, that you'll think, where do I want to spend eternity? If you're a Christian, and you're sort of teetering, do I really want to commit to God or eh, do I want to kind of like straddle that road, that center lane down the road? And by the way, we all know what they call people that walk the center lane on the road, roadkill. You need to make that decision. Eric's going to lead us in a song. And if there's anything that we can do, if you decide that you want to become a Christian, that you want to spend eternity with God and Jesus, we can baptize you today. If you're kind of wavering as a Christian and you just think that I need to get back in duty with God and make it right with Him, we can help you with that as well. So as Eric prepares to lead us in the song, think about these things. Think about eternity and your future.